but none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. Out in the desert he heard its cry, sick and helpless and ready to die, sick and helpless and ready to die. Lord, whence are those blood drops all the way that mark out the mountain's track? They were shed for one who had gone astray, ere the shepherd could bring him back. Lord, whence are thy hands so rent and torn? They're pierced tonight by many a thorn. They're pierced tonight by many a thorn. But all through the mountains, thunder and riven, and up from the rocky steep, there arose a glad cry from the gate of heaven, Rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angels echoed around the throne, Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. And I'll turn it over to our brother Chris. Thank you. I absolutely love that hymn. I wanted to sing it, but perhaps we could learn it before too long. You know, this is pretty amazing. The um, Sunday school sings, you know, the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. I stand alone in the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible. Um, I'm in a master's program, and part of my text talks about the Parchment Codex. The Parchment Codex. You know what that is, right? It's this. Parchment. Bound. You see, the Roman Empire inherited the traditions from the Greeks to use papyrus scrolls. Roll it out. But there's a problem with that. You know, it's, it's bulky, hard to transport, and you can't really pick it up, put it down, you know, go do the dishes, come back, and pick up where you left off. It's, it's really hard. There's, it, you just can't do it. So first, the first century Christians replaced the scroll with the codex form. They took the parchment, wrote on it, cut it up, bound it in a wood with wood, wood outside, wood binding, glued it together. Why? Persecution, right? They needed to record quickly. They needed to be able to move it. And now you can, you can, uh, you know, you can number the pages. You can remember where you were, you know? The persecuted Christians, they, they bound pages with a wood covering, so it would be a, have a compact size. And you know what? It was still considered second class. You know, the Romans saw that and, you know, we'll keep our scrolls. Well, by the fourth century, the parchment codex completely made the scroll irrelevant. I thought that was an interesting little, little tidbit that I learned, thought I'd share with you. If you wanted to read the actual text, I have it here. We can make copies. Um, like I said, that hymn, I, I had initially intended to, to sing it. I had a different poem to open up this, uh, this meeting. It's a poem written by John Greenleaf Whittier. Hymn for the opening of the Plymouth Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. It was the um, poem he wrote commemorating the opening of a brand new church. He says, All things are thine. No gift have we, Lord of all gifts, to offer thee. And hence, with grateful hearts today, thy own before thy feet we lay. Thy will was in the builder's thought, thy hand unseen amidst us wrought. Through mortal motive, scheme, and plan, thy wise eternal purpose ran. No lack thy perfect fullness knew, for human needs and longings grew this house of prayer, this home of rest, in the fair garden of the West. In weakness and in want we call on thee, for whom the heavens are small. Thy glory is thy children's good, thy joy, thy tender fatherhood. O Father, deign these walls to bless. Fill with thy love their emptiness, and let their door a gateway be to lead us from ourselves to thee, written in 18, 
72, to lead us from ourselves to thee. That's the title I have assigned uh, to this message here. And basically it is a you know, little context here for, for our study in the pastoral epistles. We're studying 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Maybe, maybe not in that order. Um, I've heard different things. But we're studying that on Wednesday nights. And I want to give us a little bit of a, of a context for this study of the pastoral epistles. And in the Hebrew, the word used is ro'ech, and that's for the pastor or shepherd. Ro'ech, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right at all, but it's mentioned 173 times in the Old Testament. In the New Testament Greek, uh, the word is poimen, and it's mentioned 29 times. And the meaning of that word is shepherd, both in a symbolic sense and in the literal sense. Okay, both in a symbolic and literal sense. It is closely related to the term for flock. The one word would not exist without the other. Makes sense, right? What's a shepherd with no flock? Well, he's just unemployed. <laughs> you know, what is, what is the flock without a shepherd? Or at least some kind of, you know, it's just a bunch of wild animals. Okay, one has the other. The Bible has a great tradition of shepherds. Um, and it's, it is kind of imperative that we have a working knowledge of, of, of this tradition uh, of, of the shepherd when considering these pastoral epistles. And, um, you know, by introduction, you know, 1 Corinthians one twenty seven says, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. What did Joseph say in Egypt? Well, he instructed his brothers to say this, We, your servants, have raised livestock all our lives, as our ancestors have always done. We've raised livestock, that's shepherd. When you tell them this, he will let you live here in the region of Goshen, for the, for the Egyptians despise shepherds. That's in Genesis 46:34. So we may not see exactly why God has chosen this model, this, this shepherd, but he has. He clearly has, as we'll see during this study. And, and I mentioned that you know, he uses it in a literal and in a symbolic sense. As you can see from our notes here, we're going to look at three examples. A literal example, what I've termed a hybrid. It's really both. Okay, And then we have a symbolic example. So let's turn to our first one in Genesis in our codex, in Genesis, we're going to look at the first mention of this archetype. And, and we know an archetype is, you know, is, means it's an, an original model that others follow. It's something that's set up. You know, this is the ideal. This is, this is what we're looking at. Uh, this is the picture. Um, obviously, uh, in theology, we, we use the word type. It's a type of Christ. And we'll see that the good shepherd is one that has certain qualities that fit into a mold. Okay, has certain qualities. And those qualities are what sets him apart. Okay, so let's read in, in Genesis chapter 4. We're going to see our first shepherd, the first mention of the shepherd. Genesis 4, reading in verse 1. Now, the man had relations with his wife Eve. She conceived and gave birth to Cain. And he said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the flocks, read shepherd. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. I'm going to stop there because that is the mention of the shepherd. And that's what we're concerning our, our study with. So our first example is Abel in Genesis 4. 
Abel in Genesis 4. And he was a literal shepherd, right? Literally, he was out in the pasture. He was tending. He was watching over literal flocks, right? He had sheep that he was watching. A few of the qualities, character traits that I derived from Abel were these. The shepherd has the right priorities, right? He, um, he knew to bring an offering to the Lord. The Lord was first, right? Um, Abel brought the first firstlings, you know, the, the best of his flock to the Lord. The shepherd's personal life reflects these priorities, right? He has these priorities, and now he takes action to offer the best to the Lord. You know, his resources are devoted to these priorities. The next point I saw was that the shepherd seeks out, the, when I say the, the shepherd, I mean the true shepherd, this picture, this model, right? The shepherd seeks out God's will. Do we see God speaking to Abel? Do we see God telling him what to do? No. It is implied that he sought it out or that he listened at some point in the past to either God telling him or God telling Adam who told him. Somehow, he knew. He sought it out. He listened. He paid attention. He took it to heart. We can see that through his actions. And finally, the shepherd has a righteous testimony. If you were to turn to Hebrews, you'll, hear, you'll read more about Abel, about how his, his blood testifies and and you know he is he is known as a man of faith. He is known. He has a righteous testimony. Those are some very important qualities that we have of this shepherd. In the first example, of course, being literal. Next, we have this the great example, and I I, I put it up here because I had a few words to choose from. But we're going to turn to First uh, Samuel. We're going to see a great example of a shepherd. And he was a hybrid. If I could ever turn here to 1 Samuel chapter uh, 16. Let's read at verse 1. Now we know the context here. We have Samuel. And Saul has recently done something that, again, that the Lord did not like. And he finally, the Holy Spirit leaves him. Right, And now um, we pick up with the Lord saying to Samuel in verse 1, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. But Samuel said, How can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. You shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate for you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and, asked, and said, Do you come in peace? He said, In peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. And we know that you know, he basically brings everybody to him. And we skip down to verse 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, are these all the children? And he said, there remains yet the youngest. And behold, he is tending to the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him here, for we will not sit down until he comes here. 
So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready with beautiful eyes and a handsome, appe- uh, handsome appearance. And the Lord said to him, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. From that day forward, and Samuel rose and went to Ramah. So here we have an example of the shepherd archetype who turns into an administrator for God's people. He was a literal shepherd who really had flocks and he really was out in the pasture. But then he gets anointed and he becomes an administrator for God's people to shepherd God's people in the symbolic sense. So he's both, right? Uh, One reason why I called him the great example, David. Samuel 16 through 17. Read some more later. Now from this passage, the, uh, the character trait that I saw was that the shepherd was not physically obvious. Right? It's the most popular portion of, you know, part of this you know, the, what most people talk about when they read this passage is that, you know, the Lord, you know, looks not at the outward, but on the, on the heart. And that's true. The first, you know, the first brother who came through, you know, he was great looking. He was big, he was strong, he, he looked like a, a leader, a great leader. Uh, just like Saul looked, you know, was big and strong, head and shoulders above everybody else, a great leader. God says, mm-mm, I'm looking at the heart. I don't, I don't care so much about how big he is, how strong he is, how great looking he is. But then I looked at verse 12, and it threw me for a little bit of a loop. He says, so he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and handsome appearance. I had always, from, from the way people have explained this passage, I always thought David was this scrawny looking little kid who had a, I don't know, really long nose or something, and cross-eyed maybe a little bit. He wasn't. He was handsome as well. No, he was, he was ruddy and good-looking. You know, that's why I said the good shepherd is not physically obvious. An administrator could be good-looking. He could be poor-looking. It's all about the heart, Right? He could be plain. He could be ornate. He could be anyone. So long as the Lord chooses him and he responds. Right? Does David respond? Well, let's turn to chapter 17 and read verse 32. At this point, Israel is... is is in battle, right? He's at, in, at, in, the, in the battlefield fighting against the Philistines. And a big guy named Goliath came out and started mocking the armies of the Lord, and in fact, mocking the Lord, right? Because of his army. And David wouldn't stand for it. David wanted to fight this guy, wanted to take him out. So David says to Saul in verse 32, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending the father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. 
What confidence. What a strong stance. What a bold move. God looked at David's heart. He knew that David's heart was or would be one after his own. We know the shepherd's heart is in tune, in tune with what he knows of God, right? The shepherd is confident in his God. He knew that God would deliver him. Why? Why did he know God would deliver him? Because of experience, not because of theory. He knew God, he had seen God work. The good shepherd recognizes and acknowledges God's role, even in everyday life. You know, the mundane situations, you see God working, you see God moving. The, um, a few other points that I saw here were, you know, the shepherd... He uses his talents wisely. You know, he stepped out. He knew that he had the ability. He had you know, certain things that he could do. And he was willing to put it into play. He was willing to take it and offer it uh, to the Lord's use. Also, the shepherd respects authority. He understands authority. He respects it. You know, he didn't go up to Saul and say, oh, move over, you, you, know, you lazy uh, coward. You know? Why are you scared of this guy? You could just beat him up because you got the Lord and the Lord's bigger. No. He respectfully asked uh, for the opportunity to slay the giant. And now we come to the apex example, the apex, the highest, the biggest, the best example that we have of a shepherd. And we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40, and beginning at verse 11. Actually, let's begin at verse 9. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense is before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Let's also turn to Micah. Micah I keep skipping over it. Here we go. Micah 5, beginning of verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore he will give them up until the time when she, when she who is in labor has borne a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain, because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. And of course, these, these passages we just read are, are prophecies, are uh, pointing ahead to this great shepherd who would come. And we know this great shepherd is our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Our Lord Jesus. Now I said he's a symbolic shepherd, right? He wasn't really a shepherd in real life, right? He was a carpenter like, his, uh, like Joseph was. 
purely symbolic, and obviously he was the ultimate good shepherd. He had each quality that, um, that a shepherd should have, that a pastor should have, that a, an elder should have. All other shepherds are modeled after him. He is the apex. The rest is a denouement comes down from him. He is the fulfillment of the archetype, right? All these pictures, all these shadows, you know, from Abel to, you know, to Joseph to uh, Abraham to, you know, Isaac to, to David, all of them were pointing to him and find their end, their perfection in him. And by that token, all models that come after all under-shepherds that come after are naturally flawed by humanity. But here's where he's unique. Here's where the Lord Jesus, the shepherd, the great shepherd, is unique in his care for the flock. This shepherd lays down his life for the flock. It's a strange way to lead, isn't it? Didn't we just mention that the flock would not be a flock without a shepherd? Why would the shepherd die? It, it doesn't make any sense. You know, we remember, you know, Peter, you know, saying, "Oh no, you surely, you're not going to die." Remember. God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. Those things that doesn't make human sense, he's going to turn it around, right? Um, we all know the, the word love, agape, right? It's a benevolent love. It's you know, well-meaning and kindly. Another word for it. But in the Greek, obviously, we know that it's, it's much, much more aggressive than that. It's a love that says, I know what's best for you, even though you don't know what's best for you, even though you think it's not best for you, I know it is, and I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to do it for you. You know, if we had our way, if Peter had his way, things wouldn't be good, right? Things would be pretty bad. And in, in Max Cicado's amazing work, Traveling Light, He says this, and he, he starts, he's, he's talking about, you know, how uncomfortable we, 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 we should be when considering ourselves sheep. You know, why would we be sheep? Why would we want to be sheep? You know, we should be something different, you know. Or, you know how bad would it be if the sheep stood up and took out the shepherd and tried to lead it, you know, tried to lead the flock on, them, on their own? Well, let's, let's humor him and take a little quiz to see if, you're, if you would succeed in self-reliance. Let's raise your hand if any of these describe you, okay? You can control your moods. You're never grumpy or sullen. You can't relate to Jekyll and Hyde. You're always upbeat and upright. Does it describe you? Let's try another. You're at peace with everyone. Every relationship is as sweet as fudge. Even your old flames speak highly of you. Love all and are loved by all. Is that you? No? How about this one? You have no fears. Call you the Teflon Tuffy. Wall Street plummets, no problem. Heart condition discovered, yawn. World War III starts, well, what's for dinner? Does this describe you? You need no forgiveness. You never make a mistake. As square as a game of checkers, as clean as grandma's kitchen, you never cheated, Never lied, never lied about cheating. Is that you? No. Let's evaluate this. You can't control your moods. A few of your relationships are shaky. You have fears and faults. Hmm. Do you really want to hang on to self-reliance? Sounds to me as if you could use a shepherd. Otherwise, you might end up with a 23rd Psalm like this. I am my own shepherd. I am always in need. 
I stumble from mall to mall and shrink to shrink, seeking relief, but never finding it. I creep through the valley of shadow of death and fall apart. I fear everything from pesticides to power lines, and I'm starting to act, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm starting to act like my mother. I go down to the weekly staff meeting, and I'm surrounded by enemies. I go home, and even my goldfish scowls at me. I anoint my headache with extra strength Tylenol. My Jack Daniels runneth over. Surely misery and misfortune will follow me, and I will live in self-doubt for the rest of my lonely life. Why is it that the ones who most need a shepherd resist him so? And now we come to the translation. I have five minutes. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 and verse 20. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The great shepherd is resurrected. He is alive. You know, we had a, a, a short discussion, and if you notice, every Sunday morning, I, um, I set up my board for Sunday school, and I, we're, we're going through the book Mere Christianity, and I've been uh, replacing the word Christianity with a symbol for Christianity. So I'll put mere, and then I'll put a symbol for Christianity. We'll talk a little bit about the historical significance of the symbol and, and so on and so forth. Uh, this morning, I put mere, and I put a crucifix and a cross. Right, a crucifix and a cross. And um, <clears throat> I asked, you know, which one should we go with? The crucifix or the cross, and why? And somebody said the cross, because Jesus isn't there anymore. That's a very good answer. But you need both. You know, the cross will be nothing if Christ had not died on it. We wouldn't know about it. The only people who would know about the cross would be some kind of sadist who would who reads history books about you know ancient torture. Christ made the cross. Christ died on the cross. And without Christ dying on the cross, he wouldn't have resurrected. So both are both are needed. Both are integral uh, parts of Christianity. You can't have one without the other. But it is great that the cross is empty. And so is the tomb. So he is resurrected. He is alive and he is directing. The great shepherd, the good shepherd, the best shepherd, the apex, is still shepherding his flock. Important to remember when studying the pastoral epistles. God, in his most powerful moment, was when he rose again from the dead. That's when he was really flexing his muscles. It is through this power that he can establish our spiritual blessings. Reggie Thale. Pastors do not lead independently. And I'm using pastors, obviously, elders, you know. I'm using the technical term. They follow Christ and try to bring others along. And obviously they have a standard to look to. A few, <clears throat> a few words that stood out to me in uh, verse 17 were equipping, will, working, and pleasing. What is, God, what is Christ doing? How is he, how is he you know, shepherding? How is he leading now? Well, he is equipping the saints. He's giving us the tools we need, our, our talents, um, which, is, which are the things that we, um, that we have honed, that our skills that we have developed, you know, our tendencies, those things that we are naturally born with. You're introverted, you're extroverted, you're, you know, you're what, whatever you're naturally good at. And then, of course, he's given us spiritual gifts above and beyond. Um, 
those. Um, Again, in verse 20, 21, to do his will. Well, we've been given his will, right? In Matthew 28, you can read the end of it. Um, the Great Commission. He's given us what we should be doing, uh, which would be to preach, uh, to disciple, to baptize one another, and, of course, to gather together. Working in us, he's given us the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, who comforts us, who convicts us, shows us what's wrong, he corrects us. He shows us what's right. He construes us, or of the things we say, um, meaning you know, you know, to misconstrue is to mess up what I, what I intended. Well, he interprets for us. He construes what we, what we, have, what we have to say and uh, interprets for us. And of course, communes with us. And that's probably the greatest one, because that's a relationship, right? We have a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, and of course in the end, pleasing. <clears throat> you know, there is a reward. Uh, there is reward in bringing pleasure to the one who does so much for us. And isn't that the truth? Uh, Bill McDonald said in the Believer's Bible Commentary about this passage, he says, he places the desire in us, he gives us the power to do it, then we do it, and he rewards us. What then? So we have, a, we have a great high priest, a great shepherd. He's in the, he's in the sky. He's, he's in our hearts. He's guiding us and directing us. Why do we need pastors and elders now? We've got, we've got the greatest. We've got the apex. Well, you know what? That's not enough. Let's back up here to verse 17. And I'll quickly run through this. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over you, uh, over your souls, as those who will give an account let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this will be unprofitable to you. Pray for us, <clears throat> for we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all the more to do this, so that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace who brought up the dead, <clears throat> brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes soon, will see you. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. So within this same passage, within the same context, we have leaders, men who are put in place, and they are to be respected. That is clear. Now, obviously, like I said, the apex is past. This is a denouement. Leaders, these pastors, these elders, they're not supernatural, but they are deliberately appointed to the office. Right? Um, because of their character. They have shown, they have proven their character that they do have an intense, close walk with the Lord. And since they are intense, uh, intensely relating with the Lord, intensely uh, have a great relationship with Him, well, they are put in a position where they can lead the flock as they follow And obviously, I don't believe that the mention of Timothy and Paul coming was an accident. It leads to the establishment of order. And our, we know our God is a God of order. I hope this, um, this short little message was a, provided a great context, a little bit of a context for this study in the pastoral epistles that we are conducting on Wednesday nights. Let's pray. Dearest Lord, we thank you so much uh, that you love us and, and, and that you, you give us direction, Lord. You give us direction through, uh, through your word. You give us direction through your Holy Spirit. And dear Lord, we thank you that, uh, that you raise up men uh, just like me, just like each and every one of us. 
help them to, uh, to have a relationship with you that they may lead us. We pray that we would, uh, uh, we would uh, be cognizant of that fact. Dear Lord, we pray that we would uh, be sharpening one another as iron sharpens iron, Lord. And we pray that uh, we would grow in, in, in grace and in the knowledge of you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.